Good afternoon. It's Tuesday, August 11th. I'm Laura Cornfield, and this is IBA News, broadcasting from Jerusalem. It's been cleared for publication today that Shin Bet security forces arrested a Hamas operative involved in the terror group's tunnel digging efforts, as well as recruiting terrorists. During his interrogation, the man, identified as 21-year-old Ibrahim Sha'ar of Rafa, provided forces with various information regarding underground tunnels that Hamas is currently building from the southern Gaza Strip into Kerem Shalom in Israel. Shar also told investigators that Iran has been actively involved in bolstering Hamas inside Gaza through funding and the supply of advanced weapons and electronic equipment, including devices used to intercept Israeli drones. It was revealed that during last year's Operation Protective Edge, Shar provided Hamas fighters with military equipment and explosives. He also participated in placing roadside bombs in the path of IDF tanks and took part in Hamas patrols. Shah provided additional information as to the group's tank defense skills, including their ability to observe movements of up to three kilometers within the borders of Israel. Turning to the natural gas negotiations, and there are signs of crisis in the marathon talks between the state's regulatory team and representatives from the American-based Noble Energy Company and Israel's Dela Company, both of which are developing the country's offshore gas fields. The talks ended overnight without agreement. Energy Minister Yuval Steinitz said that the energy companies presented demands that he could not accept. Steinitz stressed there were three main issues that stood in the center of the disagreement, including the price, the stability clause, and the development of the Leviathan Reservoir. The companies are also insisting that any terms reached under the new framework that's being advanced by the Netanyahu government must not be changed for at least 10 years. Yesterday, Bank of Israel Governor Karnit Flug voiced her support for the plan, saying that despite her reservations, she believed the deal will be good for Israel's economy. Prominent rabbis from the religious Zionism movement have announced the establishment of a network of courts which will work to convert non-Jewish immigrants from the former Soviet Union who live in Israel, but not as part of the state conversion system. Here with more is IBA's Eli Walgalanter. In a direct challenge to the authority of the chief rabbinate, the group of senior national religious rabbis announced the formation of a new network of conversion courts that will work independently from the formal state conversion system operated by the chief rabbinate. The formation of the court comes a month after the government canceled a landmark conversion reform that was passed in the previous government. Conversion reform was originally intended to enable rabbis in their individual cities to perform mass conversions of Israelis who are not Jewish according to halakha or Jewish law, but who have Jewish ancestors. At present there are some 350,000 Israelis of Jewish ancestry, mostly children of immigrants from the former Soviet Union, who are not considered Jewish and are defined as religionless meaning they cannot marry in Israel. Most of these children speak fluent Hebrew and serve in the IDF. The rabbinical figures involved fear that intermarriage between Jewish Israelis and this community of non-Jewish immigrants from the FSU will increase rapidly in the coming years, posing a real threat to the unity and cohesiveness of Jewish society in Israel. Among the senior rabbis who have worked to establish the new courts are Rabbi David Stav, chairman of the Tsohar Rabbinical Association, Rabbi Shlomo Riskin from Efrat, Rabbi Yaakov Midan, co-head of the Haaretz Yon Yeshiva in Alon Shvut, and Rabbi Reim HaKohen, chief municipal rabbi of Otniel and dean of the Otniel Yeshiva. The new courts will be headed by Rabbi Nachum Eliezer Rabinovich, one of the leaders of religious Zionism. Rabbi Stav explained to Arut Sheva the problem of conversions via the chief rabbinate. First of all, the official policy of the chief rabbinate is not to allow kids, even those who learn, who study in observant schools, in Mamlachti Dati schools, not to enable them to convert if the parents are not observant or the mother is not converting. Despite the fact that they commit themselves and they guarantee to enable the kid to grow up in an observant environment. That's the main pro problem. The other uh, challenges regarding the issue of the approach to the converts are you suspicious all, uh, on, on, a base, on a constant basis, or do you trust them, basically? Are you do you try to encourage them to, con to convert? Are you embracing them, or uh, that forbid the vice versa? Uh, that's uh, that's uh, the main challenge. As the facts are that we have less than 2,000 converts. I think that this number says everything. According to the group, the new court is absolutely necessary, as these children are already well integrated in Israeli society. Called Giyur Kahalacha, or conversion according to Jewish law, 
The new conversion courts are a collaborative effort among several institutions that have advocated for conversion reform with the backing of the Jewish Agency. Jewish Agency Chairman Natan Cherenzi explained to me why he welcomed the move. Such an important issue of uh, joining people, uh, Am Israel uh, uh, in a, or, through Orthodox conversion cannot be dependent on coalition agreement between one party or the other. Or there is, uh, if there is such a need, it should be above the politics. And there is such a need because we are, in the, we continue the process of gathering of exiles. Practically every Israeli wants that we will continue this process. And uh, Jews and diaspora live in the conditions of lost identities, in the conditions of assimilation, and there's not a lot of mixed marriages. And we nevertheless want that uh, under the law of return they'll continue coming. It means that a lot of people who are coming are galactical and non-Jewish. And the question is, do we want to welcome those of them who want to join not only the state of Israel, but the people of Israel and Klal Israel? Uh, are we interested that it will be a welcoming process? And the only way to do it, welcome process, is to give opportunity to every rabbi who has the right, who is appointed by chief rabbinate to uh, and is permitted to have conversions, who has experience of hundreds of thousands of conversions, can he have a, a court to do it? And there was decision that yes, we have to give to rabbis of the city such an opportunity. That there was decision that in new coalition there will be no such opportunity. So here are rabbis, very respectable rabbis. All of them uh, had have hundreds of thousands of confirmed conversions. Uh, be, behind them, and they want uh, to continue doing it through independent courts. Uh, I think it's very positive, it's very good, uh, and uh, I hope that very quick, soon uh, they will be recognized as part of official established network of conversion courts. Right now, the rabbinate, chief rabbinate is saying that we will not recognize that. What happens in the end game? All these people convert, they're listed under the new conversions, but the state doesn't officially accept them. Well, Chief Rabinet is part of uh, uh, state, is part of the... Uh, in fact, they're working for the government, Chief Rabinet. And uh, I hope that in the end, the government, elected by people of Israel, in the end, sooner or later, will have the right decisions, and they will be made. But the practice, the reality, forces us not to wait, but to take uh, actions. And exactly as Jewish agency and its last board of governors made a decision to help to those communities who need, the, who don't have conversion courts, and who need help from the rabbis from abroad, we decided to help to those rabbis to reach these communities. Uh, we welcome the fact that uh, the respectable uh, recognized rabbis uh, in the state of Israel decided to do everything to help to those who need uh, to go through conversion to do it. And if this doesn't work, we're looking at a possible split in the Jewish community? Well, uh, uh, Jews always try to create new and new reasons to, for split, so there will be no lack of reasons to split uh, anywhere. Uh, but I think it is a, a big interest that uh, all those Jews in the world who want to be part or uh, to, to live in Israel will also feel themselves, and those who want will be, feel themselves part of Jewish people. And Jewish people will feel that they are part of us. An ultra-Orthodox school has canceled a planned visit by President Ruven Rivlin, who was set to speak at its opening ceremony for the upcoming school year. The cancellation was apparently due to remarks he made defending the rights of the LGBT community following the stabbing attack, as well as his sharp condemnation of the Duma arson. According to Army Radio, the publicly funded Kihilot Yaakov School in the northern Jerusalem neighborhood of Ramot disinvited Rivlin at the instruction of its rabbis, stressing that the president has become a persona non grata at the institution. Jerusalem Mayor Nir Barkat slammed the school's decision as a complete mistake. Shas M.K. Yaakov Margi, who chairs the Knesset's Education Committee, condemned the move, 
and called on Education Minister Naftali Bennett to further examine whether the school's principal should continue to lead Israeli students. Deputy Defense Minister, Minister Eli Ben-Dahan of the Nationalist Religious Jewish Home Party also criticized the exclusion of Rivlin, saying that the president remains the state's number one citizen, even if one disagrees with his views. Meanwhile, President Ruvi Rivlin today hosted a delegation of Republican members of the U.S. Congress in a meeting arranged by AIPAC. In his remarks to the visitors at his residence, Rivlin emphasized the dangers of the Iranian deal, saying that the current regime in Tehran acts with a dangerous combination of aggressiveness, fundamentalism, and state-sponsored terrorism, threatening, even without nuclear weapons, freedom and democracy in the region and around the world. Congressmen talked about the importance of relations with Israel and of their opposition to the Iran nuclear deal. I see this relationship very strong and only getting stronger. If you look at the number of members who are here today and then even last week as well. I know you had the minority party last week and we have the majority party here this week. Um, this is not my first trip to Israel. Um, led a few of these going through. And it's already strong bond before from the creation of Israel when it was founded in 1948. But we have shared values. Those shared values of freedom, of, of respect, of human rights, of democracy. But it also in those shared values bring us shared enemies. Um, and I see that bond even stronger today um, and only getting stronger as uh, our relationship continues to grow. I don't necessarily agree with the president's analogy it's either this or, or conflict. I think we can spend some time and uh, really uh, use the advantages we have. As Reagan said, peace through strength. Uh, I believe that's a, a strong negotiating power when we're dealing with anybody uh, with us versus the U.S. If you look at it just um, from the sense of a 24-day waiting period before they come into an inspection, you can hide anything in 24 days. That alone is absolutely ridiculous and irresponsible. Jewish Democratic Senator Chuck Schumer is facing an onslaught of allegations, including those of treason, for announcing recently that he will vote against the Iranian nuclear deal. Dozens of political activists have posted remarks on social media suggesting that Schumer's loyalty lies only with Israel. Some even accused him of receiving large sums of money from the pro-Israel lobby AIPAC in exchange for his support. The Anti-Defamation League criticized the accusations, calling them a slap in the face to Schumer's long years of service to the United States. After being moved from Soroka Hospital in Beersheva to Barzilai, Doctors at the Ashkelon Medical Facility are also refusing to force-feed hunger-striking Palestinian administrative detainee Muhammad Alan. We get more on this report from Dennis Zinn. Palestinian prisoner Muhammad Alan, who is on an open-ended hunger strike which began some 50 days ago and was moved from Soroka Hospital in Beersheva to Barzilla Hospital in Ashkelon, is still complaining that he is not allowed to access to his lawyer. The reason for the transfer has not been made public, but it's believed that the government hoped that the medical staff at Brasilai would carry out force feeding, a procedure that was rejected by doctors at Soroka. However, it now appears that their hopes were short-lived and that Brasilai will not comply either. The director of Brasila Hospital, Dr. Hezi Levy, said, force feeding of a patient who is on a hunger strike is a move that does not comply with any code of medical ethics. This despite the fact that the Knesset passed a law in June allowing doctors to conduct force feeding if a prisoner's life is in danger. The prisoner, Muhammad Alan, a lawyer from Nablus and a member of the Islamic Jihad terror group, is being held under administrative detention on charges which his lawyer says are unknown to either of them. Alan's family and supporters are conducting protests outside the hospital and in the West Bank to garner support for his right to fast until he is charged or released. I would say that uh, with regard to the International Committee of the Red Cross's position, we have a clear position on force feeding. We're obviously opposed to force feeding or force treatment of detainees because this would be opposed to their integrity, their rights, and their dignity. And this is a position we've made clear to the Israeli authorities, as I said, prison services, but also medical doctors. Uh, so whether he's, uh, uh, depending on where he is, we will discuss this situation again with the doctors in the hospital, uh, wherever he is. Human rights activists say that the real problem is not whether or not to force feed, but the actual act of administrative detention. It's very important to keep 
the medical ethics clean and not involved other reasons which are uh, political, more political, or foreign affairs even, uh, reasons which the uh, Israel uh, government try to enforce now. Internal Security Minister Gilad Erdan said, in light of the refusal of the hospitals to carry out the force feeding, it will ultimately be up to a civilian court to decide on the issue. Dennis Zin, IBA News. Two residents of the Jews' village of Majda Shams on the Golan Heights have been indicted in the Nazareth District Court on murder charges for their involvement in a brutal mob attack that killed one of the two wounded Syrian nationals who were being transported in an ambulance from their country's civil war to a hospital in Israel in June. The defendants, Bashira Mahmoud, a 48-year-old woman, and 21-year-old Amal Abu Salah, allegedly can be seen in a video of the attack beating and stoning one of the wounded men as he lay motionless on the pavement outside the Golan village of Nevatif. The state said its case has also been helped by testimony from the IDF soldiers and paramedics in the ambulance that were present and witnesses who put the two defendants at the scene of the crime. Police said that the investigation is still ongoing and that they have, more arrest, have arrested more than 30 people. Police have arrested four additional suspects in a far-reaching corruption investigation, including former heads of major public organizations suspected of bribery, fraud, and money laundering. Police are working on the theory that the suspects conspired to skim money from payments of state funds to local councils and other public bodies and inflated budgets to award state, co state contracts to associates. Two of the suspects named were Israel Yeshua, a Jerusalem-based lobbyist and former chairman of the Likud party, and Alexander Witznitzer, the former chairman of the NTA Metropolitan Mass Transit System, both of whom were first named as suspects when the scandal broke last year. New suspects identified are Shaul Mizrahi, the former head of local government economic services, and Yeshayahu Beres, the former CEO of Netive Israel, the Israel National Roads Company. In local money matters, the shekel weakened in foreign currency trading, while shares were mixed on the Tel Aviv Stock Exchange. Here are the late afternoon numbers. And turning to the weather forecast, a no change in temperatures expected over the next few days. Here are the highs and lows for the next 24 hours at home and abroad. And that's all for this newscast. Aaron Viner will be here tomorrow with more news from Israel and abroad. Until then, I'm Laura Cornfield wishing you a great evening and shalom from Jerusalem.